Claire Bernal, a shy, successful young woman. Everyone that met Claire just loved her. She works at world-famous department store Harvey Nichols, as does former Slovakian soldier Michael Pesch. Just by looking at him, I didn't get a good feeling. I never got a sense that she'd fallen in love with Michael. She was very flattered by his attention. Then Claire's world closes in. Fifty texts a day. Wherever Claire was, he was. Waiting on her doorstep. If you report me, I will kill you. Following her home from work. Never once did we think that he could possibly carry out his threat. It turns into a nightmare. He is batshit crazy, and he is dangerous, and he is unstable. And he's obsessed. Twenty-two-year-old Claire Bernal is on her way to London to interview for her dream job as a skincare consultant in London's exclusive department store, Harvey Nichols. Claire's with Adam Ward. They became best friends whilst working together at a local shop in Tunbridge Wells. We met at the train station. She'd prepared sheets and sheets of A4 paper that she's handwritten out. And on the hour's train journey to, to Charing Cross, she was saying, can you test me on this? Can you test me on this? And then we're literally going through page after page after page, testing her. And then once we'd done it, we'd do it again. She, she was so nervous about, about the interview and the job. And we took the tube to the department store. And I said, right, OK, give me a call when you're done. Claire leaves the interview and immediately calls Adam. She said, oh, I don't know if I've got it. I don't know how well I've done. She, she was full of self-doubt. But um, of course, she got the job. And uh, I never doubted that she would. Claire goes home to her mom, Tricia, to tell her the good news about her new job. Even when she was 12 years old, she was really interested in makeup. And she used to, you know, play around with, and she was far better than I was. And, and um, she naturally wanted to sort of go into that line of work. Claire often confided in her cousin, who she grew up with in Tunbridge Wells. She was phenomenal with makeup. She has this amazing portfolio of all her makeup creations. People recognize that she had a really good gift. She always had a passion for the beauty world. When she got the job, she was made up. She absolutely lived and breathed it. She always looked flawless, um, but she never looked over made up. It, it, it was as though it was just completely natural. She had a real talent for that. Claire moves in with two other girls. They all work together at Harvey Nichols. They're renting a flat in Dulwich Village, South East London. Claire was very excited about moving to London. Uh, it was showing her independence and, and she settled very quickly in this, this flat. And as and when we tried to see each other, mum and daughter, as much as possible, and we were on the phone most, most days. When she got offered a position at Harvey Nichols, I imagine that that would just be like a great opportunity to leave hometown and spread her wings and experience like a very different life.
She wants you to be in the city, living the life. And when you're that young, it's the dream, isn't it? You want to live in the city. You want to be going out to the bars and, and the nightclubs and, you know, living that, that lifestyle. At work, Claire's incredibly popular and everyone warms to her. Everyone that met Claire just loved her. She was a very gentle soul. I can't think of a nasty bone in Claire's body. and I really can't. I never heard her say ill of anyone. She used to get hurt by people, you know, disappointed by people, but she never said anything bad about them. She was good fun to be around. We used to giggle and laugh about the most silly, stupid things. She was also very girly, a super feminine person, very kind, very sweet, really angelic. She was really happy to be working at Harvey Nichols. I mean, it's probably the most prestigious place to work, so she was always incredibly proud to say where she worked and who she works for. Everything is looking up for Claire. She's loving her new job and is really happy in her Dulwich flat. Claire is at the beauty counter when she's approached by one of the store security guards, Michael Pesh. They get chatting and he asks her out on a date. Claire just casually mentioned that there was a man at work who, who was pursuing her. And at that time, I, to be honest with you, didn't really take too much notice because men were always pursuing my cousin. He was a bit older than Claire. He was a good-looking chap, and when he asked Claire out, she was quite flattered and agreed. He said nice things to her. He talked about them being together. Claire was so unaware of her beauty, and it was funny because we'd be walking down a street and I would notice heads turning and I'd know that it wasn't because of me. And she wouldn't have a clue at all. Claire wasn't the most confident person. She would be the absolute last person to realize when a guy was interested in her and, and she'd always be quite, quite shy about it and quite coy. She had no idea. Claire and Pesh begin to see each other outside work. He's infatuated with her straight away. He's very attentive to her, complimenting her clothes and her shoes. Claire's very flattered. Their relationship, I guess, seemed pretty innocent and normal with the whole, like, asking someone out and then going for a coffee or so, and just very casual. Michael Pesh is a Slovakian and had moved to the UK two years earlier. He started working as a security guard at Harvey Nichols, just shortly before Claire joined the team. They only dated out a very short amount of time of three weeks. I know that my cousin did not love him. So, no, it was not serious. Claire and Pesh are only at the very start of their relationship. But Pesh is head over heels with her. Claire's cousin, Kristen, quite quickly has her doubts about Pesh. I realized that this was a very different person to what she'd usually attract. He was quite a bit older than her. I can't remember how old, but there was a fair bit of um, age difference. I believe Claire told me that he had been married before. She told me a little bit more about him. And, you know, he was much older than Claire. And he was going through a divorce, and it wasn't an ideal situation that any mum would want for, for their young daughter. Now, during the time they dated, 
I never got a sense that she'd fallen in love with Michael. She was very flattered by his attention. Any feelings Claire has towards Pesh don't last. Soon after their first date, he becomes possessive and controlling. Claire phoned me up and said, Mum, I feel really uncomfortable. He just wants to be with me the whole time. He doesn't want me to, to see my friends. He, he doesn't like me going home. I'm feeling suffocated. It's all happening much too quickly. Michael Pesh is a former soldier in the Slovakian army and has previously worked as a security guard at the American embassy. Claire finds his attention overbearing. After just three weeks, she's had enough, but she's worried about breaking it off. Alarm bells started to go off for me when he told her that he loved her. After a very short amount of time, I believe it was probably no more than three dates that they had been on. The red flag just started waving. Beauty consultant Claire Bernal is living in London. She's been dating Michael Pesh, a security guard at the famous department store Harvey Nichols, where she's working. Pesh is on his way back to England from Slovakia, where he's been visiting family. He calls Claire and demands she meets him at the airport. On his return, he'd insisted that Claire met him from the airport, and which Claire was not greatly happy about. It was half past five in the morning, so... But she did, because that's all the way Claire was. She, she, she liked to please people. He uh, had a large case and said he couldn't fudge it across London and he would take it the following day. Claire's reluctant to let him stay over at her flat. She's only been seeing Pesh a few weeks, but he insists he has to stay over. The next morning, Pesh won't leave. She was upset. She said that he had refused to go. She'd walked him to the station, a train had come in, and he refused to catch it. And in the end, Claire said, you do what you like, I'm going home. Claire's had enough and tells Pesh it's over. He calls Claire over 20 times. She doesn't answer. He just sat outside for two hours. Claire told him to go. The two flatmates also, in no uncertain terms, told him to go. And eventually he left. Now that's when the stalking actually began. Um, and it was tireless. Having dumped Pesh, Claire feels she can't get away from him. At work, she can feel him watching her, using mirrors to observe her secretly. He follows her around the store. Being a, a security guard, he would watch Claire on the moment she arrived at work till the moment she left. Pesh approaches her counter. He insists she takes him back. Claire tries to ignore him, but he won't leave her alone. He would involve other people. Uh, he pleaded with them to speak to Claire. There were work colleagues that thought, all you need to do, Claire, is just talk to him. He only wants to be your friend. And she did at one point, said, look, Michael, just stop this. But of course, it just made things 10 times worse.
It's evening at Harvey Nichols. Claire has finished her shift and is collecting her belongings to go home. She leaves the store, but Pesh follows her. Outside, he creeps up behind her and grabs her shoulder. He tells her he loves her and that he knows she loves him too. Claire tells him that she doesn't, and he says, yes, you do, you stupid little girl. Claire is scared and confused, but doesn't think she can report him. She was embarrassed. She was embarrassed about the attention she was getting in the store. She felt by reporting it, because he hadn't physically harmed her, that um, she'd be wasting police's time. Claire is trapped. She feels she can't tell anyone other than her mum and cousin about Pesh's increasingly disturbing behaviour. I think Claire didn't tell me about Pesh because she felt embarrassed that she dated this guy for three weeks, that she'd let him into her life. So I think we all like to think we're a good judge of character. Claire's world is closing in. She's distracted at work, and she feels she's constantly being watched by Pesh. She's terrified Pesh is on her doorstep, always scared he's waiting outside for her. Her health was affected. She wasn't sleeping at night. She was getting eye infections. She was getting into trouble with work because she was late or she, she wasn't concentrating. And her, her world was shrinking. Pesh follows Claire everywhere she goes, to work, on the train, at home. She can't relax. He would follow her to her place after she had finished work, which would mean that he would catch a train with her. And then when he got to her place, he would sit outside her place and be pissing her and her roommates off. He was following her home on the underground. He was following her on the train back to Dulwich. He was hovering outside her house. Wherever Claire was, he was. Then Pesh bombards her phone with calls and texts, professing his love for her. The texts were constant, you know, up to 50 times a day. His behavior becomes more and more sinister. His messages read as if they're still together. Claire was really good at downplaying things, but I could tell that she was really skeptical and found it really weird, like really weird. Claire and Pesh had only been on three dates, but he's fixated with her. He starts making regular threats. He was saying things like, I will kill myself if we are not together. If I can't have you, no one will. For Claire, 
It's the end of another long day at work. She leaves Harvey Nichols and heads to the tube. Claire was walking down the, the platform. And she caught sight of Pesh there again. To Claire's horror, Pesh is following her once more. She ran down the platform. He ran after her. He jumped on the train after her. He sit, sat opposite her. Claire tells him to leave her alone, that she wants nothing more to do with him. She tries to run away again, but Pesh chases her. And then he pushed her. That's when Claire went around to him and said, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to have to report you. And he went very close to her face and said, if you report me, I will kill you. Claire phoned me up, crying. I was frightened. She was frightened. But never once did we think that he could possibly carry out his threat. Things like that don't happen. She told me what had happened at the tube station. And my heart just sank because I knew that, OK, this is really serious now. Claire and her mom, Tricia, are terrified. They can't decide if they should report him to the police. We did think he could get more angry. We did think that by reporting, potentially it could exacerbate the situation. They don't know where to turn, and Claire felt ashamed of what was happening to her. Claire felt stupid because she dated somebody that was so, you know, strange that would do something like this. She was embarrassed. In fact, even her closest friends, her school friends that she saw on her days off and things like that, many of them didn't even know about Pesh. I knew absolutely nothing about her relationship with Pesh um, because we could go three, four weeks, two months without, you know, catching up. So her three-week relationship with Pesh, it's very easily that we weren't in touch with each other. Claire couldn't hide the situation from her flatmates and her friends have had enough of Pesh's threatening behaviour. They report him to their bosses at Harvey Nichols. Pesh was moved by their boss to a different department. So he was still working at Harvey Nichols, but just on a different schedule, different floor. That unfortunately didn't make any difference to his behavior. He still continued stalking her. The head of security was told. He took it very, very seriously. He was an ex-police officer. He put cameras on Claire and on Michael Pesh and very quickly saw that, yes, he was harassing Claire and stalking Claire. He sent Michael up to another floor. He kept coming down to Claire. And the reality was that unless Claire reported him to the police, the only thing that Harvey Nichols could do was suspend him, of which they did. Pesh casually asks a member of staff what the sentence for murder is in Britain. Harvey Nichols' head of security finds out. He convinces Claire she has to go to the police. On the surface, the police took it 
really seriously. They interviewed Claire, took statements from her. She tells them everything Pesh has put her through, that she's had to change her number due to his constant texts and calls, that Pesh has threatened to kill her. Pesh is called into work. He's sacked, and the police are there to arrest him. He was escorted out by two police officers, in fact, in front of Claire. And Claire phoned me and said, Mummy looks so angry. Even then, she felt responsible in some way to, for his arrest. After enduring weeks of Pesh's constant harassment and stalking, Claire is still wondering whether she was right to report him to police. Claire was just ground down by it. I mean, she felt partly responsible. She said, oh, maybe I led him to think that I cared more for him than I do. She didn't want to get him into trouble. She just wanted it to stop. Pesh's relentless abuse of Claire is becoming increasingly clear to her whole family. If you're the person involved and you never know what is going to happen day from day, night from night, you see this same person, you know it's not there by accident. He's there with an evil intent. And it is terrifying. It is terrifying. Police take Pesh to the station, and he's charged. They give him a non-molestation order. He was then given a bail condition to not go anywhere near her, absolutely no contact. Pesh is released back out onto the streets. Claire and her housemates still don't feel safe. They're moving to a new flat, in an effort to keep out of Pesh's reach. They were in the process of moving to, uh, it was uh, one of the girls and herself were moving to another part of Dulwich village. As Claire prepares to move, she's alarmed as she sees Pesh on her doorstep once again. He was smiling up at Claire as, as she was packing. Uh, the police were called, he was nowhere to be seen, and nothing was done at that point. Just four days after he's been arrested and ordered to stay away from Claire, she's in her new flat in Dulwich, and Pesh is lurking outside. He's managed to track her down already. Claire calls the police. At first, they can't locate him, so Claire gets in the police car with them and they drive around the area. Claire pointed him out. He was in the doorway. Uh, they arrested Pesh in front of Claire. He smiles at Claire as police handcuff him. He's in custody once again. It just hit me, and it hit Claire, that potentially he could carry out his threat because he was beyond the law. He didn't, he didn't care about the consequences. He is batshit crazy, and he is dangerous, and he is unstable, and he's obsessed. Pesh is charged with threatening to kill Claire. He's released on bail once again to await trial. He apparently disappears. 
after weeks of torment, Claire finally relaxes. We didn't want to know what had happened to him. Life got back to normal for Claire. It was Claire's birthday. I said, how about you and I going away to Italy? Just, you know, mum and daughter, and it's, it's a special treat. And we had five magical days in Florence. We laughed. We went along to this music festival and there's all this cheesy music and we're dancing and giggling together and it was just, that time is pure gold, and, uh, and, and it, she was at her most beautiful. I just looked at her and I thought, well, Claire, you're not only my daughter, but you, you're, you're my best friend, you know? And I, I just, I, I don't know, she just grown up so much over those last few months. Whilst Claire and Tricia are on holiday together, Pesh is back in Slovakia. At a firing range. The former soldier takes weapons training. He obtains a firearms license. He registers a handgun with the Slovakian authorities. Claire's family and friends, and Claire herself, didn't know that Pesh had returned to his home country, and it was there that he was taking firearm training. My personal view is that when he was let out of prison, the ease of which you can buy a gun, that was never, ever taken seriously. The fact he'd made a threat to kill and he, um, he was a military man. Michael Pesh is traveling back to London on board a coach. In his luggage lies a Luger handgun he's bought in Slovakia. I can never get over the fact he was released on bail. He managed to get through the border controls. Who should have picked up this man from his record? I mean, it's mind-boggling that, that there was no control on that. Pesh is facing a day in court to stand trial for harassing Claire. There was one black cloud that Claire was treading, that the case was due to be heard at the end of August, and there's, there's a chance that she would still have to see Pesh. Claire was actually encouraged to drop the charges of kill threats because it would be hard to prove that he was threatening to kill her. And so she was asked to drop those threats. At the last moment, he changes his plea to guilty. There will be no trial. Claire won't have to face him in court, and it's a massive relief. I got a call to say, Mum, I can finally put this awful episode to bed. He will get a minimal fine or a community service. There's no reason for people to be angry with me. And finally, now I will be believed. Claire emails her cousin, Kristen.
Pesh has pleaded guilty, but pending sentence is allowed to walk free. Claire is on the beauty counter at Harvey Nichols. Her day started off as a very normal work day. She went to work. I think it was a Tuesday. Just before 8 p.m., and Claire's shift is almost over. There were a few customers milling around. Everybody is sort of lulled into that quiet time, going home time. Claire and her colleague in the beauty department are looking forward to leaving work. She put her hand up to Claire and looked at her watch as if to say 10 minutes to go. And she said Claire gave her this beautiful smile. Security staff have been told to keep watch for Pesh, but he makes his way into the store through a side entrance. On the shop floor, Claire's colleague notices him. It was at that moment she saw a shadow appear behind Claire. And she thought it might have been a boyfriend meeting Claire after work. It was Pesh. He was high on cocaine. He raised a gun and he shot her at the back of the head. She fell and he shot her three times in the face. Pesh fires another shot into the ceiling before turning the gun on himself. Claire Bernal died at the scene. She was 22. It was so surreal. It was so surreal. Everybody was in shock. It just felt like it was happening to someone else. I know that when he shot her, that, that she, she, she would have been gone before. She even hit the floor, and I hope that she, she had no idea what was, what was going on. Um, that I pray that she, she, she didn't feel any pain. You can never write a, a, a loved one out of your... out of your love. It'll always be there. I miss her very much. When it happened to Claire, I was out with friends celebrating the birthday. Came back quite late, about midnight. I heard a loud bang on the door. I went downstairs and um, they, there were two police officers and one of them said, it's Claire. And I knew by their face that she'd gone. And then they, he said, uh, the family liaison officer said, um, she's been shot. And I said, it was Pesh, wasn't it? And he just nodded. In her grief, Trisha began to look at other cases. She realised she was not alone. I started campaigning with two other mothers. We realised very swiftly the power of families who've lost a loved one, working together with professionals to improve the system. Nobody can dismiss a mother who's lost her daughter and we could shout from the rooftops and nobody could stop us. As a way of coping, Trisha and others set up the charity Protection Against Stalking. It's our mission to raise awareness of the danger of stalking, 
to be involved in training, speaking about our daughters and demonstrating the danger that they were in, the danger signs. During her search for answers, Tricia met Laura Richards and they began to work together. I have to say that Tricia just showed such humility and just she really just wanted answers to ensure that it didn't happen to anyone else's daughter or loved one, and she moved me. That could have been my mother stood there, that could have been any one of my friends, families, asking questions. They should have a right to ask those questions when their loved one's been brutally murdered. Laura and Tricia lobbied the Prime Minister of the time for the law to be changed. Absolutely. And I think there is a very clear difference between harassment and stalking. This pressure paid off. Stalking would become a criminal offence for the first time. The existing law isn't good enough or strong enough. I don't think we've done enough in the past, and I want us to do better. These are cases that I call murders in slow motion. Trisha's view was always that she just didn't want this to happen to somebody else and that Claire would never come back, but she wanted to ensure that the lessons were learned. Good afternoon, National Stocking Helpline. When you say he was kind of all right at first, what sort of things did he start off doing? The helpline offers victims advice from staff specifically trained to deal with stalking cases. If you were in the unfortunate position of being stalked, my cousin would want you to know. Reach out for help. You've got nothing to be ashamed of. I know that there were times when my cousin would feel embarrassed about it. If you are being made to feel uncomfortable or even harmed, you have every single right to reach out and speak out and get the help that you deserve. The strongest message I can give any victim is go to the police. Make sure they take it seriously. If they don't take it seriously, call the helpline. Nobody has a right to control anybody's life. I'm very proud of Trisha. It's very easy in to collapse under the pressure. You can fight it or you can just go under. And now she's done what I think is right. She has fought, she's achieved amazing things. I will continue to do this work as long as it takes because it's still happening. And that's why myself and other families do what we do, because we really do think it makes a difference. <laughs>